Thanks for joining us for lesson intro three of Learning to Fish. In our previous lesson, we challenged ourselves to be careful of how we approach the text. That is not to drag our personal presuppositions and pre-understandings into the text, as well as our personal wants and desires that would cause us to misinterpret the text of scripture. In this lesson, instead of looking at what not to do, we are primarily looking at what we should do in order to properly understand and interpret the text. Now, having grown up in church my whole life, I've come to enjoy some of the more comical things that happen when you get a group of people together, especially from all different walks and backgrounds of life. Uh, and the church is certainly a host to these mishmash of persons. And it's quite evident during prayer time when you take requests from the floor. My favorite requests, speaking lightheartedly, are the medical ones. As a pastor, I've spent a lot of hours in hospitals, nursing homes, physical therapy clinics, and so on. But I really have a hard time keeping up with all of the medical jargon. So it comes to prayer time and people will make requests for certain upcoming procedures. Now, if they just say, I'm having a procedure, number one rule of thumb, never ask what that procedure is. You assume that they don't want you to know what the procedure is. However, at times I've found out that the procedure is something as simple as having an ingrown toenail or something like that work done. Uh, but you'll also hear people making prayer requests for certain procedures or involving certain fields of medicine that sound like Latin or Greek, probably because they are. And you have no idea what they're talking about. Now, I've learned that if it ends in ectomy, they're cutting something out of you. And when a lady makes a request about something ending in ectomy, you just don't ask what it means lest you embarrass yourself. But as you hear and learn different terms, it becomes easier to understand the nature of what is being discussed. You learn that a pathologist is not somebody who studies paths, or fasciculation simply means a muscle twitch. I am going somewhere with this. Terms help us discuss subject matter and often consolidate an entire body of thought. So there are a couple of terms that you may hear tossed around every so often in the world of Bible study that sound like fancy highfalutin jargon that make you as excited as you would be about a word like fasciculation. If you've heard these words, you may wonder what they are, why they are important, and who needs to be involved in whatever they are about. Or you might not care at all. Today we're talking about the words hermeneutics and exegesis. And before your eyes glaze over and you navigate back to your Facebook feed, I will try to tame these beasts for you. So starting with the word hermeneutics, it is the branch of knowledge that deals with interpretation. Now, where did a name like hermeneutics come from? It's actually said to have come from a mythological Greek deity named Hermes, who was the messenger of the gods, whose job it was to mediate between the gods and man. And that picture actually works pretty well in explaining hermeneutics because we're talking about words in one context and bringing them into another context with the intention of understanding what the original, original author meant or intended as he or she used the words in the first place. As a familiar example, this sort of field of knowledge is involved in the judicial sphere regularly. The U.S. Supreme Court, for instance, is constantly engaged in discussing the intended meaning of the words of the laws that were previously written. What did the framers of the Constitution mean when they wrote, you know, A, B, C, whatever? They are attempting to understand authorial intent by means of the words that they wrote. Hermeneutics is something we engage in all the time whenever we read what other people wrote. For instance, if you read the words, all right, let's kill it. How would you interpret that? What would it mean to you? Well, it sort of depends, doesn't it? It depends a lot on, on, on a lot of different factors. Who is saying it? Why are they saying it? What is it? Is kill literal or figurative? What was said before? What was said after? We're asking questions about the speaker, the audience, the meaning of the words, the context, and perhaps the time period in which it was spoken, etc. It is, the, about, is it about two people standing over a beached whale about to put it out of its misery? Or a couple of mechanics listening to a sputtering engine just before they turn it off? Or a band just before they take the stage? Or a sales team about to call through a list of phone numbers? You get the idea. Context word meaning, culture, history are so important in understanding information. The same is true for understanding scripture. 
A good Bible student is going to ask questions about all of the factors involved in and surrounding the text that lead him to as clear a meaning as possible so that he rightly understands what the author intended as he originally wrote the content. So when you think hermeneutics, think in a broad sense, interpreting or finding meaning. The process, now we're moving on to another word, the process in getting to in getting to that meaning is what we call exegesis. It is the critical explanation or interpretation of a text. Now, where did that word get its name? The first time I remember hearing it, I thought it sounded like Jesus, you know, exegesis. And I was confused as to why Jesus' name was used in this way, uh, but it doesn't come from Jesus' name. Exegesis, like hermeneutics, comes from a Greek word, and it means to draw out. Make sense? We're talking about to, or we're taking the words that we have uh, that we have, and we're drawing out from them meaning and understanding. You may have heard a preacher say something like, well, let's unpack this text together. Well, unfortunately, that phrase has become a bit cliche and misused because most of the time they don't actually unpack the text. But if they were using that phrase correctly by unpacking the text, they would be doing exegesis, looking at the text and carefully drawing out the meaning. Well, that involves some digging, word study, historical analysis, contextual analysis, studying the author, the audience, the culture, the flow of thought in a passage or a book, and so on. And as we said before, sometimes it's easy, but sometimes it takes a lot of digging. And most of the time, however, we can avoid some major pitfalls by asking a few questions and following some guiding principles. The principles I'm about to share are common to doing good exegesis. However, I have borrowed this outline from Dr. Mark Strauss, and you can find his hour-long lesson in the description below. These principles are an attempt to help maintain an objective view of the text so that different people from different times and different backgrounds should be able to look at the text and come away with the same general understanding as to what the original author meant when he wrote the text. The first principle is sort of the overriding principle, and it is, number one, to seek to determine the author's intended meaning. We want to try to get at as much as possible what was in the mind of the author when he originally penned the words. This principle implies that there is a meaning to be found and that it is a single meaning. We're not looking for, to find multiple meanings, nor are we trying to impose our own meaning on the text. We are approaching the text in the most natural fashion, fashion assuming that the author had a single meaning in mind. Why is this important? Well, let's take a look back into church history to illustrate. An early church historian named Origen viewed the scripture quite uniquely, which led to some interesting ways of interpreting the text. While all Orthodox theologians have believed that the text was divinely inspired and that the authors were under the influence, direct influence of the Holy Spirit when they wrote the words of scripture, Origen took it a step further and believed that the text had an almost parallel allegorical spiritual dimension to it, which made any hope of an objective interpretation impossible. For instance, Origen looked at the story of Joshua's conquest of Canaan, in which five kings attacked Gibeon and eventually defeated, um, are eventually defeated on that day, and God miraculously lengthened the, the, a day that God miraculously lengthened. And he concluded this: He said, "Now these five kings indicate the five corporeal senses: sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. For it must be through one of these that each person falls away into sin. These five senses are compared to those five kings who fight the Gibeonites, that is, carnal persons." Origin goes on, that they are said to have uh, fled into caves can be indicated perhaps because a cave is a place buried in the depths of the earth. Therefore, those senses that we mentioned above are said to have fled into ca uh, caves when after being placed in the body, they immerse themselves in earthly impulses and do nothing for the work of God, but all for the service of the body. We'd have to look at an interpretation like this and ask way, why or how did Origen arrive at this particular conclusion? With such a method or lack of a method of interpretation, you could get the text to say anything about anything. Did the author have this in mind when he talked about the five kings? Uh, were they the five senses in that author's mind? Not likely and certainly not indicated anywhere in any way. We have to be careful that we don't similarly add arbitrary meaning to the text that certainly would have never been in the author's mind. Now, as a note, we do realize that certain texts do have a double meaning. For instance, in John 3, Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. The word again in this text in the Greek is the word anothen, meaning either again, as it is translated, or above. That is, you must be born from above. 
Jesus seems to be using a wordplay as he's describing a person who has experienced the second birth. However, this is a spiritual one which originates from God. So does the passage open the gate to allegorizing the Bible because it has a double meaning? I'm going to again say no, because as we look at the text in its context, it is clear that the author's single intent was to have a double meaning. The second principle is this. The meaning of the text is genre-specific. Genre, that might be a word you hear here and there. Uh, this is a principle which in a way should be obvious, but it is so often forgotten. As we hold in our hands the Bible, we might be tempted to assume that it is a single work written by a single person or a group of people in a particular setting in which they sat down and, and through painstaking collaboration produced the work that we have today. But that's not how the Bible is written. Instead, God used about 40 men across hundreds of years in different cultures and writing for different reasons to preserve for, for us what we call the Bible. The genres, that is, the specific categories of composition used in writing the different works in the Bible, matter immensely in interpretation. For instance, the Bible contains poetry, legal language, historical chronology, proverbs, prophecy, personal and formal letters, gospel, and general history. Each of these demands that we look at the text according to the rules by which it was composed. You would not interpret a letter uh, the same as you would a legal briefing or a work of satire. In fact, you wouldn't interpret a personal letter the same as you would a letter to an editor or to a committee. Scripture contains very specific genres that have their own rules, such as a parable or apocalyptic literature. We will look at these further, uh, in, further into these uh, in upcoming lessons, but su suffice it to say, to ignore genre is to risk misinterpretation. Okay, so far then. Number one, seek to determine the author's intended meaning. Number two, the meaning of the text is genre specific. And now the third principle. Context is the key to interpretation. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because we've, we already have and we will further in future lessons, but it demands to be emphasized again. Context is king. This is true in personal conversation, journalism, legal disputes, and almost every form of communication we participate in. It is certainly true in scripture. Not only seeing the words, sentences, paragraphs, sections, and books in their literary context, but also in their historical context. As a brief example, the book of Philippians was written by Paul, um, and it contains an overarching message to rejoice and not to succumb to complaining and fighting in the midst of external difficulties. But what we realize and what gives this letter a whole new dimension is that Paul himself was writing this letter while suffering in a Roman prison. This little bit of contextual knowledge provides us with a helpful contextual lens as we look at this letter and several other letters Paul wrote. Number four, the text itself must be given priority. What do we mean by this? Let's take a step back. As we come to the text of scripture, we are coming to it in order to find meaning and to gain principles by which to live. That is, we are hoping to apply it to our lives. We are coming from our context to the context of scripture, trying to make application. So when we come to a passage such as Matthew 19, and Jesus says this, if you would be perfect, go and sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. In seeking to make application to a passage like this, most of us will probably immediately have an internal reaction that goes something like this. Well, certainly God wouldn't want me to sell all of my possessions and give money to the poor. And that reaction that we have is probably not first and foremost because we are convinced by the text that it says something else, but because we don't like the idea of selling all of our possessions and giving them to the poor. So then our next reaction, if, if we're at least moderately trying to obey God's word, is to say, well, now I need to find where it says that I don't actually need to sell all of my possessions and give the money to the poor. In the end, our highest goal may be not really to understand what the text says, but to make sure that the text says something that uh, uh, doesn't say something that conflicts with my personal interests, such as my possessions. In giving the text priority, we are putting what the text says first. Even if it seems to conflict with something that I may previously have understood or personally care about, we're asking, what does the text say instead of what do I want the text to say? Now, obviously, we're looking at it, at it historically and, and contextually in the specific genre and so on. But in the end, if we determine that the text says something we should 
says something, we should not try to make it say something else to fit our worldview. As a believer, I want the text to shape my worldview. When we meet for our local Bible study, we are going to study some passages of Scripture together and as a group, apply the four principles above to those passages. If you'd like to come ready for discussion, look over the book of 1 Peter 1 in verses 24 through 25 and ask, Why did Peter decide to quote Isaiah 40 as he encouraged his Christian audience to love one another earnestly from a pure heart? Thanks for this lesson, and we hope to see you at our next Bible study get-together.